Good evening. I'm Gary Schaefer, Director of Glendale Library Arts and Culture. On behalf of all the public libraries in Los Angeles and Ventura counties, thank you for joining the Southern California Library Cooperative and my library for our second event in the series, Be the Change, Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Anti-Racism. Be the Change events build collective understanding of systemic racism, elevate the voices and stories of Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and inspire our community to be the change. The series is generously supported by the City of Glendale Arts and Culture Commission, Outlook Newspapers, and Niche Academy, which is graciously hosting us on their platform. I also wish to acknowledge that I'm presently located in the Los Angeles area, and in my case specifically in Glendale, California, which is the traditional lands of the Tongva people. I also wish to pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and acknowledge a 5,000 plus year culture of learning. You'll find more about Be The Change events and information at glac.info slash be the change. For instance, we are currently featuring the online exhibit Nowhere and Everywhere in our Reflect Space virtual gallery, which can be accessed from this page. It presents a visual exploration of the ways Native Americans are represented and misrepresented through popular culture while creating a counterpoint to this imagery through humanistic photographs by Native artists, including Navajo artist and filmmaker Pamela J. Peters and Kiowa, Kiowa sorry, photographer Horace Pula. Please visit the virtual gallery via the Be The Change website on your screen. Tonight, in honor of Native American Heritage Month, we are pleased to be hosting Walter Echohawk in conversation with Rick West. Walter is a Pawnee tribal leader, lawyer, tribal judge, scholar, author, and activist. His legal experience includes cases involving Native American religious freedom, prisoner rights, water rights, treaty rights, and reburial repatriation rights. Walter is the author of two nonfiction books and one work of historical fiction. You can order signed copies of any of his books from Once Upon a Time Bookstore in Montrose using the link on our Be The Change website. Interviewing uh, Mr. Echo Hawk will be Richard West Jr., President and Chief Executive of the Autry Museum of the West since 2013, and a citizen of the Cheyenne and Arapahoe tribes. Previously, Rick was the founding director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C. And if you have not yet visited that amazing museum, please make it a part of your post-pandemic plans. It truly is a wonderful learning and beautiful, beautiful museum. Uh, prior to his time at the Smithsonian, he spent nearly 20 years as a Native rights attorney. Mr. West recently announced his plans to retire from the Autry in 2021. In its final year before he retires, Mr. West will be named President Emeritus and Ambassador Native Communities, will host a series of capstone events that draw on his tenure as a museum director in Washington, D.C. and Los Angeles, as well as his background as a Southern Cheyenne peace chief and the son of a Native contemporary artist. These events will reflect upon current trends in museums, how cultural institutions can best survive during crises, such as the COVID-19 pandemic and broader considerations for presenting history in a divided society. Uh, during the talk, we encourage you to email questions throughout uh, to libraryinfo at glendalca.gov. And now I'll turn the virtual mic over to Walter and Rick. Gentlemen. Thank you very much, Gary. I appreciate the, the generous introduction. I appreciate your acknowledgement of the land on of which we all sit, including the Octary and the Griffith Park site, as well as our uh, other facility, uh, that we are here at the courtesy and with the hospitality of the Tongva Gabrielino community and people. And uh, we appreciate that and appreciate your acknowledging it here. I want to welcome an old friend and colleague, I shouldn't say old friend, a friend of long standing, uh, Walter Echoha. Uh, we have known each other for many, many years. We are both from Oklahoma. Uh, we sort of came along in that first wave of native lawyers that uh, were emerging from law schools back in the 1960s and early 1970s. Uh, Walter, I want to welcome you 
uh, to Los Angeles. We are honored to have you among us, and uh, I look forward to a stimulating conversation with you. I encourage you to do two things if you're listening and participating in the webinar. Uh, please do feel free to email the questions and don't wait until the last minute. Get them in and get them flowing as soon as possible. And uh, at about 7.10, we will go from a discussion conversation uh, that Walter and I are having uh, to entertaining questions, which you may ask us. Uh, and we will be happy to respond to those too. So let's go ahead and get started. But first of all, again, welcome, Walter, uh, to Los Angeles. We're glad that you're with us this evening. Thank you, Rick, and uh, good evening. Um, I am very elated to uh, see you and to be with you. Uh, and uh, of course, my thanks to uh, uh, Mr. Schaefer, Gary Schaefer, and everyone at the City of Glendale Museum and the sponsors. Uh, I'm just so thrilled to be here, uh, of course, uh, with my, my dear friend, Mr. Rick West, longtime hero of mine, a colleague, and um, I'm also uh, want to greet everyone uh, who has tuned in. I'm uh, broadcasting to you live from the great state of Oklahoma. <laughs> Thank you, Walter. And again, we do appreciate the uh, collaboration. This is not certainly the first we have had with the Glendale Library. Uh, we're very appreciative of it. They've been a great, a great partner for us. And so we are grateful to collaborate with them again this evening. Uh, Walter, I, I want to sort of begin more generally, if I may, to, to give you a chance to contextualize the, the writings that were referred to. I know that we are focusing on the uh, in the courts of the conqueror uh it is the uh, 10th anniversary of that book and it certainly accounts for a great deal of your career as an outstanding native activist and native attorney and lawyer uh in defense of a variety of, of both native rights and human rights as far as i'm concerned uh, i also great fans of, of the other two books that I think we should be referring to and may even talk about just a little bit here in the light of justice, uh, as well as the, uh, the Sea of Grass. Uh, one thing that I wanted to ask you, Walter, in some ways, for me, the, the books were sort of written in the reverse order, which is to say that I certainly understand as a lawyer uh, in the courts of the conqueror. Uh, and I very much am interested in the light of justice because of my own interest along with yours, which isn't always true with native lawyers, uh, because of its reference to an international content, which is really important. But it seems to me that the connector for both of those books, even though it is the last book published uh, of the three that I just named, uh, is The Sea of Grass, which has so much to say about how you contextualize in light of your own history uh, the other two books and what you talk about there. And I'm reminded of a couple of things you say, one of which is in the acknowledgement section of uh, The Sea of Grass, as well as your quotation from Cicero, which cautions us all to make sure that we remember and know of our ancestors and ancestry, because if we don't, we really, in some respects, remain children rather than grown adults, if you will. So tell us a little bit about the two books in the context of, of its relationship with this story of, of your own kind of broader cultural and life context. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Rick, for that question. Uh, and it it's uh, very interesting the way you uh, sort of picture my uh, book, The Sea of Grass, the last in this trilogy that we're going to be talking about today um, as sort of the prequel. <laughs> uh, uh, but it's uh, what it is, it's a, uh, it's a uh, novelized history of my own family. And of course, um, um, everyone, all of us who are living today, and you and I, and, and um, Everyone that's tuned in, you know, uh, we we share one great truth, and that is we all have ancestors that go far back into time, and those ancestors have uh, very powerful stories to tell, 
and deserve to be told. And my my effort in my own family is this <clears throat> sea of grass, which came out in 2018, which is my story of the Echo Hawk family and our Pawnee Nation history in the Great Plains of North America. And uh, th this uh, book, which was uh, inspired by uh, Alex Haley's Roots, sort of a Native American version of, of Roots, traces 10 generations of my family uh, in the central plains of our nation uh, back to the uh, oh, mid-1700s mid, uh, and all, brings it all the way down to uh, the present day. And certainly uh, it's, it's, I guess, my own history and my own roots. Um, and uh, th this uh, book was, which was such a wonderful journey for me. It, it, uh, it, it's uh, an account of, of the lives and times of 127 of my own relatives. These were real pe people who lived in real places in the Central Plains, uh, whose lives were shaped by real historical events and as elaborated on by our uh, family of uh, traditions and, and uh, oral traditions, uh, uh, stories among our uh, Pawnee tribal elders and, and, and historical uh, e events, you know. Um, but it's kind of, um, I guess you could say it's, um, it's kind of a rare uh, book in that it's a, a story about the Pawnee people actually written by a Pawnee and not a non-Indian author. Um, and and uh, as, as such, it, 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 uh, I tried to uh, basically provide an authentic uh, uh, Pawnee uh, voice uh, in telling the story of the Pawnee people. And I think it, it provides a rare uh, insight into um, Native American um, and especially Pawnee history and culture. Um, but uh, I've been, I was on a, a grand book tour all the way up until the pandemic <laughs> cut me off short on this uh, book. As I say, it came out in, in 2018 and um, uh, has a, 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 a nice place in my own heart because it is a personal story of the history of my own family and uh, shows, it would show a reader, I guess, you know, at least where I came from. You know, and we all, as I say, uh, we all have roots that extend back into time, and and um, uh, mine are laid out in in this particular book. And I wrote it uh, for younger members of my family, so they'll know who they are, and where they came from, and how they came to be part of our country in which we live. Well, I appreciate that very much, Walter. And I, I guess the one of the points I appreciate most is something with which. I certainly can identify too, uh, having been first a lawyer and then museum business, and that is that you wrote it yourself. This is not this is not this is not Walter and his family in the, in the third person voice. This is a first person story. But but let's take that first person voice and and talk for a few minutes about uh, about in the courts of the conqueror. And, and I, I guess what the way I would focus the question is this. So why, why was it so important, both as to the premise of the book and the content of the book, that you talk about the 10 worst cases in the Supreme Court affecting Native people? And you could have made it much longer. I must say you could have talked about the top 50 as far as I'm concerned. But you did talk about your top 10. And so explain why that focus, why not talk about the Congress or talk about, so what is this unique relationship in history uh, that is both cultural history and legal history about focusing on decisions of the Supreme Court? Well, uh, th um, thank you. Um, I, I thought you were gonna ask me some easy questions. <laughs> but, um, uh, this this book in the courts of the conqueror um, and that title was borrowed from John Marshall when in in 
the 1830s when he described the federal court system as the courts of the conqueror, um, which makes a native person wonder how well we'll, we will fare in the courts of the conqueror. But um, I, I am first and foremost a litigator in my legal career and um, have was uh, even remain so today, you know, an indigenous rights attorney. And uh, um, uh, I have been deeply concerned about um, the trend in federal Indian law since the mid 80s towards trimming back on our Native American rights. And um, um, which has led many of our legal scholars to ask, you know, is federal Indian law dead? That is uh, federal Indian law being the legal framework in our country that defines the rights of native people and our relationships and responsibilities. And so I thought I, I would try to diagnose uh, the cause of these uh, this anti-native uh, uh, legal judicial trend that had upset upset me and troubled me personally as a as a native rights attorney. Um, and so this what this book is the uh, Courts of the Conqueror. Um, it's kind of a unique uh, study of the law pertaining to native people in our country and it's a critical analysis of our current legal framework in that it studies the dark side of the law that affects native americans and uh, throughout american indian history and it attempts to understand uh, the forces at work in these supreme court cases that have uh, manifestly unjust outcomes for Native people. You might call them miscarriages of justice. Um, so uh, what I did basically was to to uh, pick 10 of the worst cases. I initially had thought about I'd do some kind of a sophisticated survey among my colleagues. Uh, uh, but at the end of the day, I said, oh, shucks, I'll just pick them myself. <laughs> so I picked um, I picked 10 cases that um, employed um, that are still the law of the land today. They've never been reversed. That uh, turned on uh, some nefarious legal principles um, and produced a manifestly unjust outcome and uh, basically studied those cases. That is, I, I read in great detail the four corners of those opinions and then I looked at the uh, historical uh, context in which those uh, uh, decisions were handed down to try to identify, you know, the, the forces at, at work that possibly contributed to those outcomes. And uh, I, I was uh, looking for common threads in these cases uh, and seeing what lessons could be learned about the nature of uh, justice and injustice in our society. And as it did turn out, uh, the, these 10, 10 cases that I looked at uh, each of them have very good stories to tell, 10 very gripping um, stories about epic encounters between two uh, cultures in American history, um, uh, conflicts uh, and encounters over very vital um, issues that took place in our American court system. And these are all true stories, they're etched, uh, in our judicial annals, um, and really they're, they're cases about the colonization of North America uh, and the harsh effects that that had um, upon the native people of this land um, as manifest destiny swept through the continent. Um, these cases um, 
basically upheld uh, dispossession, um, subjugation, uh, marginalization, everything done to the Indians was perfectly legal in the courts of a conqueror. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I was thinking, uh, especially because of, of the events of this past week, uh, that, that you and I and all those who are participating in the webinar have witnessed, namely an election that uh, years ago, you may recall, Walter, I, my primary uh, law practice was at Freed Frank, and Freed Frank was a firm in Washington, D.C., established by Felix Cohen. And not that everyone listening to the webinar would know who that is, but for Walter and me, he was the author of what is probably still, even in its uh, modified and updated form, uh, sort of the principal legal text having to do with uh, with uh, American Indian law. And so Walter and I, Walter spent his entire life practicing, in which I spent a good deal of my life practicing. And one of the first things I, I read after I got to Free Frank was the set of briefs that Felix Cohen had written in 1948 in order to, to try to combat, which he did, and he succeeded, uh, the attempts of the states of Arizona and New Mexico to, to, to deny the franchise, the voting franchise, uh, to, uh, native, uh, native, to Native community members in both of those states. So it's a, it's a fight that goes on. One, one thing I would ask you, uh, Walter, you know, we're taught in law school, and there may be some other lawyers listening into this, um, that somehow uh, the body of law, including supposedly principles of American Indian law and how we practice that, sort of descend from the sky in kind of pristine and discreet form and have no engagement or connection with the broader social context around them. What struck me about the cases that you presented and the stories they tell is indeed the fact that there is not that kind of separation. That what you saw spinning out, as you point out in your reference to Manifest Destiny, um, was court actions that actually were driven by the broader social context. Did, did you have that sense when you were going through these cases of that kind of connection? Well, yes, you know, and of course, um, um, I was inspired in the um, writing of this book by the late uh, Vine Deloria, you know, who was um, sure. a, 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 a scholar, a, a, a giant of a thinker, and, and a very a, a critic of American um, society in many re regards, you know. Um, and al also Professor Rob Williams, who was a uh, 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 just a predominant uh, scholar of federal Indian law from Arizona State University uh, School of Law, who has studied this uh, dark side of federal Indian law and um, uh, really traced the origins of this uh, dark side of the law that keeps our native rights vulnerable. Uh, through the uh, international law of colonialism, as was adopted in whole cloth by the Supreme Court in the 1820s and 30s by the Marshall Court, uh, and trace those roots all the way back to medieval uh, Europe, you know, and, and um, um, so these, these cases that I looked at, um, they, they were, uh, uh, all of them are microcosms of, 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 of uh, this dark side of federal Indian law uh, that uh, produced, uh, I think, uh, what you can only call it uh, miscarriages, I think, of justice uh, uh, with a lot of common threads in them that you can almost diagnose. I mean, many of the cases, for example, um, they uh, began, or the early on the opinion, there's a, an apology, you know, that says, oh, gee, you know, uh, we, we, uh, we, can't, we can't look to uh, notions of abstract notions of justice. We can't get involved in, um, in uh, debates over morality, uh, but uh, we, we, um, 
we uh, uh, have to, uh, but fear not, you know, because we, we're, our people are a, a good hearted Christian people and we're always going to treat the savages and with good faith, you know. Whenever you see a, an apology of that in a judicial opinion, you, it's basically sign, sign language or code something very unjust is about to happen. <laughs> yes, no, no, that, that's right. Um, so, so let me let me ask you, uh, Walter. So, what do we what do we do about that, if anything? Uh, you you talked about this construct, which is the legal system, which has had great impact upon um, upon native peoples and communities. Is there any way to reform that? Uh, how do we avoid exactly the outcomes that you have just described? Is it still an instrument, the constitutional and legal system in this country, for um, effecting uh, fair justice or not? Well, uh, <laughs> excuse me. Um, yes, I think that these uh, these cases uh, can be reformed, and I've uh, spent some time in this book, Courts of the Conqueror, to uh, to sort of identify a pathway of, of doing that. But, um, uh, excuse me, Rick, are you still with me here? I'm seeing some changes. Of, oh, okay, good. Yeah, I know that, I, that it sort of scrolled up different, but now it seems to have settled down again. And I'm oh, right okay, I, I just wanted to be sure we were still well, together I'm here. Yeah, um, but, uh, you know, uh, basically, um, uh, you know, like if you look at Black America and its struggle from Plessy v. Ferguson, the Supreme Court decision that was decided in 1896 that established the U.S. law of racial segregation under the separate but equal doctrine, that, that, that Supreme Court decision was the law of the land all the way up until 1955 in Brown v. Board of Education. And uh, that's a 58 year period in which black America uh, was uh, working to try to overturn that decision and, and uh, move from uh, segregation under the law to to uh, equality under the law and um, um, in contrast so they basically changed their legal framework from one of racial discrimination to equality under the law by contrast uh, native america uh, when you and i went to law school and we got out of law school as some of the uh, first generation, I guess you could say, of modern Native rights attorneys, we simply took the existing legal framework as we found it, that is federal Indian law with both its good side and the dark side. And uh, we had a simplistic strategy was, was simply to try to coax the courts into applying the good side of federal Indian law with its protective features. That is to uphold the treaties, that our tribes have the inherent right of um, sovereignty and self-government, and that there is a protectorate relationship between the Indian nations and the U.S. government. And under those uh, protective features uh, of that existing framework, two generations later, we, we have witnessed uh, great strides, you know, in the rise of these modern Indian nations. Uh, and then we simply uh, lived with the dark side of federal Indian law with all of these anti-indigenous functions and have never to this date uh, mounted a frontal assault on that dark side of the law in the same way that Black America uh, mounted a frontal assault on Plessy v. Ferguson. And so I, I feel like um, we, we have uh, basically uh, taken our existing framework uh, as far as it can go. 
um, in the year 2020 and to advance much further in our native or indigenous aspirations, we, we have to turn and mount a frontal assault on the dark side of our legal framework because there's a great yeah. truth, uh, there's a, a, a truth here that a race of people can only go so far in their aspirations under a unjust legal framework. And there'll come a time where they have to turn and mount a frontal assault to reform those unjust features. And I think that's where we stand today. We've got a, a number of Supreme Court cases that need to be reversed. Uh, that could be a generation of legal work under the current Supreme Court. But we also have a, um, um, a new pathway to reforming uh, federal Indian law, and that is through the, uh, the, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Yeah, I do, want to, I do want us to talk about that. Um, in fact, that's what we should turn to, and let, let's do that, because we will be opening up for questions fairly quickly. Um, but I think that that's very important. And uh, I would just say, in brief preface to that, that you are fairly unique, even among lots of very good native attorneys in, in focusing on that in the way that you have. And of course, that is front and center uh, in your, your book, In the Light of Justice. And just tell us how you think that actually helps us in, in ways we may not have utilized in the past to confront the dark side of the existing construct. Uh, in the United States through these other Supreme Court cases. Yes, thank you. Um, well, this is a very timely subject uh, for a number of reasons that I want to get into, and I think California will play a critical role in, in reforming the dark side of federal Indian law. As I mentioned, this dark side of federal Indian law comes to us from the law of colonialism. And uh, now, uh, and we know that uh, the uh, colonialism has been rejected by the United Nations shortly after uh, World War II um, as an oppressive um, institution. And um, <clears throat> so, um, this declaration is the antidote to the lingering ill effects of colonialism found in nations around the world. And, and what, uh, what the, the Declaration does, or the United Nations did, it went to the larger body of modern international human rights law and drew from that existing body of law uh, uh, norms from customary international law provisions from UN human rights treaties and put them into this declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples so that native people around the world would ha have the same human rights that the rest of humanity already takes for granted. And uh, that declaration provides a, uh, the, the purpose is remedial, that is to rid the link legacies of colonialism and replace that with human rights. And so uh, it, it, the, the, the declaration that UN asked the, each nation to work in partnership and good faith with native people to implement all 46 articles of this declaration, which is a comprehensive, standalone human rights framework for defining uh, the, the uh, rights of indigenous peoples. And uh, so if, if our nation, and there's 150 nations around the world who have endorsed it and are in the process of implementing it at various stages, if, the United States, which approved this in, uh, declaration in the year uh, 2010, implements it in conjunction with native people, 
it would in effect replace the dark side of federal Indian law with these human rights principles and precepts. And, um, and so uh, I think the challenge of the hour uh, as lawyers is to uh, uh, preserve the strongest features of federal Indian law and then replace the dark side with these human right principles to create a, a, uh, a seamless, uh, uh, strengthened, more, more just and more reliable body of law that is, is basically uh, um, uh, compatible with the very best in our US uh, uh, legal culture. Uh, because um, um, if you look at the 10 best Indian cases ever decided, you will see that those kinds of cases comport with this UN declaration. Yeah, uh, that's, that's true. Are there any examples yet, and, and maybe you're suggesting that California could be sort of first on the list, are, are there any examples of, of jurisdictions, governments kind of incorporating what is a declaration? And of course, you and I know that a declaration per se does not become an international convention or treaty, which really those have more of the force of law, if you will. Uh, but but have, there, have there been instances of um, other states, if you will, uh, or other governments applying the provisions of that in the form of actual law? Yes, that's that's true, and that's why this is such a timely discussion. Because uh, uh, in uh, 2019, last year, about this time last year, uh, the province of uh, of uh, British Columbia in Canada enacted a law that aligned all of the laws of that province with the Declaration and called upon the provincial government to work with indigenous peoples to implement all of the provisions of the declaration. Now that that uh, is a landmark piece of legislation in North America uh, that, that uh, could be used as a model not only throughout the rest of the provinces of Canada uh, and, and it, it, its national uh, uh, legislative branch and uh, also has some pending legislation in it as well mm -hmm. but that the British Columbia statute uh, provides um, uh, a model for the lower four of uh, the United States in, including California and um, um, there is a, a, a Native American a uh, social justice law reform movement underway at the present time. And scholar, legal scholars say that this is a lawmaking moment, a, a juris, generous moment in the history of uh, uh, indigenous rights in the United States as we stride towards um, uh, implementing it. And, and uh, there has been formed a national project to do so by the Native American Rights Fund uh, in Boulder, Colorado, which is our uh, leading uh, public interest uh, Native uh, law firm, working with the CU uh, Colorado University School of Law to create a joint uh, national project to implement the declaration in the United States. UCLA in California, the Native Nations uh, Native Law and Policy Center under Professor uh, Angela Riley is working hand in hand with this national project as well. And I think their first step is to, um, is to uh, uh, foster a legislative movement among the 560 federally recognized Indian nations in the United States to pass tribal laws uh, like British Columbia's that endorse the declaration and call upon other jurisdictions to do the same and oh, uh, yes. yeah along I, the, along the, I think that along the way that that california might be low-hanging fruit you know your legislature working in tandem with the california tribal leaders 
could do a same same thing that would set a national pre precedent in our nation in in the on the legislative arena here. Yeah, well, as you and I were talking about this earlier today, I. I you described all the reasons why, even though I'm a fairly recent arrival to the uh, California bubble, I love it and I don't intend to leave it. And I hope <laughs> that we are low hanging fruit. While we may not be latitudinally quite British Columbia, we are longitudinally quite related. Um, uh, and and so uh, I hope that uh, there there is some the fruit born to what you're what you're describing. Now I think we are at the point where we do need to open up for uh, some questions, and the way this will flow, I think we're getting an assist, if I'm not mistaken, by having some of the questions stated to to us, uh, Walter, and then we'll okay. have questions and some responses until just before 7:30, when Gary will circle back to sort of uh, close the evening for us. Uh, but uh, I, I'm hoping I'm going to hear another voice coming onto this conversation that actually frames some of these questions for you to answer, Walter. Um, you, you will. Good evening. Okay. <laughs> Hello, Rick and Walter. This is Bye. Julie from Niche Academy. We have a lot of great questions for you both, Good. and uh, we'll try to get through as many as possible. The first one says, good evening, Nawa Walter. Thanks for your insights. What impact, if any, would you expect from this quote unquote revised court of the conqueror, the US Supreme Court on Indian country? Well, uh, we, we have a, uh, a current Supreme Court that uh, is re-entrenched, I think, as far as the packing of that court with uh, right-wing uh, jurists by the Trump administration. And uh, it, it, uh, it's going to make uh, a lot of, of, um, of um, a long haul, I guess you could say, the work of a generation. This is a long-term, in many respects, a long-term uh, process to overturn a Supreme Court decision. And I have a short list of about nine or 10 Supreme Court decisions that need to be overturned. Um, and so um, just like NAACP took 58 years to, to overturn Plessy v. Ferguson, uh, it may take us uh, a while, but I think uh, we need to start now. Um, I know that that branch of government um, is probably not going to be very receptive to indigenous uh, efforts to uh, to uh, uh, basically um, uh, begin a judicial discourse in our courts about the nature of human rights for native people. I know the courts in Canada, there's about 30, 35 or 40 reported decisions now where Canadian courts at all levels are engaged in, uh, in uh, uh, adjudicating cases that are brought under this declaration and creating some judicial discourse on the nature of human rights for Native people in Canada. Um, I see as I sit here that uh, 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 the um, uh, it looks like um, Joe Biden is is um, closing in on the on the White House, and that would be a step in that direction, you know, to to take a hard look at this court, which I think is is going to be um, rowing against the tide in our nation here, because our our nation is uh, is one of great diversity. Uh, it's a uh, 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 and this court is not does not reflect that, you know, and so it's, it's going to present a challenge. It's going to be, uh, there's, there's no doubt, you know, but there are other branches of government. There are uh, legislative branches. Uh, there are um, uh, administrative branches as well. And I think that uh, uh, w what is called for here is a broad social justice campaign to stride for human rights, uh, in Native America, uh, on all uh, state state level, tribal level, and the federal level, in all of the branches of government, and we're going to need um, 
Americans of goodwill to help us along the way. Um, and um, um, I, I remain very uh, optimistic, you know, that, that uh, the stars are, are getting aligned just for this yeah. campaign. Walter, can I, can I just ask you quickly before we go on, how, how, do, you, how do you look at McGirt in this analysis? Uh, is, is that just an exception? Yes. Uh, well, the uh, the McGirt uh, decision um, was a, a, a huge victory for Native America, um, and I know that um, uh, I haven't. Uh, I I don't. I'm not saying we should give up on the court, but the uh, uh, the McGirt decision, just for the listeners, is is um, a huge victory for. Uh, uh, Indian nations in Oklahoma. There are 39 uh, Indian nations in Oklahoma, and the the McGirt decision ruled uh, just this summer in July, early July, I believe, that the Creek Nation uh, reservation boundaries have never been altered or diminished in any way, shape, or form, and that includes uh, about five counties in Oklahoma, including the town of Tulsa. And uh, so, so um, uh, of course, this this was uh, before the most recent appointment uh, that sort of creates a six to three uh, kind of a schism in the court. So those kind of uh, decisions, like the McGirt decision, it did not create any new uh, legal principles. It simply applied uh, existing federal Indian law principles of treaty uh, interpretation and, and the canons of federal Indian law to the facts in that case and just sure. said yeah, that on, only uh, Congress can diminish a reservation and they they haven't done so here <laughs> and yeah. uh, that that but the, how the human rights could kick in though is that uh, there's backlash now in Congress under the so-called uh, plenary power of Congress over Indians where uh, Senator Inhofe, one of the dinosaurs in, in, from Oklahoma in Congress, who's been there about 100 years, uh, uh, a number of years ago, snuck into the chambers of, of uh, Senate chambers under the co cover of darkness and tacked on a midnight rider, uh, one paragraph a midnight rider to an 800-page uh, transportation bill that basically said, um, notwithstanding any other law, if, if the state of Oklahoma ever requests EPA to grant Oklahoma jurisdiction to regulate environment, environmental programs in Indian country jurisdiction, EPA shall grant that. Well, in the wake of the McGirt decision, the governor of Oklahoma did just that, and in the blink of an eye, and the stroke of a pen, the EPA uh, granted the state of Oklahoma to do that, which is in uh, uh, grants the uh, power of Oklahoma to regulate, come into tribal jurisdiction and uh, abrogating uh, the EPA said, well, that abrogates all of the treaties of all of the tribes to allow Oklahoma to come in and regulate. It just shows you how vulnerable our our uh, rights are in the United States if this declaration were the law of the land uh, you couldn't trammel on inherent human rights because these are indefeasible they're inalienable rights and they do uh, protect our treaties and our rights to self-government, our lands, our in, in indigenous habitats as well, and entitles us to environmental protection, not environmental exploitation. Sure, yeah, no, I do, under, do understand that. Um, hey, well, let's, uh, uh, if we can, squeeze in a couple more questions. Definitely, and I would like to thank you both for the direction that your answers just took because several people were asking about the McGirt decision, so uh, well done. <laughs> uh, here's a question, uh, since you're talking about human rights, what do you think about the need for a truth and reconciliation or truth, justice, and healing process in the United States in conjunction with genocide and cultural genocide, among other injustices? 
Yes, that's uh, th that's uh, uh, certainly part of, of the process here in um, in um, implementing this declaration because it's a it's a it calls for remedial justice, and uh, it's going to require a national dialogue on uh, the nature and content of human rights for Native people. This this is a national discussion that we've never had before, and um, um, it, 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 it's it's going to um, uh, basically require a, uh, a, a, a truth and a reconciliation process to heal uh, un, unhealed wounds from a painful past of conquest and colonization. And, and to uh, restore uh, uh, justice between the conquered and the conqueror, to restructure those relationships on a human rights basis. And uh, we, we need to, along the way, uh, develop a philosophical foundation for a human rights movement of this nature to be the underpinning for a movement that can get our people up out of the chair marching for human rights for the first Americans. And to do that, I think um, we need to just uh, look to our wisdom traditions of the world religions, which say there are basically five steps to healing a, a painful past. and and every religious tradition uh, gives lays out the same pathway the first step is that a harm has taken place you have harmed someone and in this instance the harm is conquest and colonialism um, which has uh, had very harsh impacts on our native people we see a history of historical trauma in our communities we see these hard to solve social ills that are the end products of that process. And so an injury has taken place. And our wisdom traditions say that once you've injured someone, you must go to that person if you want to heal that injury and apologize. In step two, apologies are so very difficult to do but they have to be sincere, truth-telling kinds of an apology on bended knee. We would never see that coming from the present White House, I know that. But you have to apologize to remove the guilt and ill, Ill feelings uh, and, and to begin clearing the way to move to the second, the third stage here, which is to accept an apology. It's very hard to an ac accept an apology if you look at Rwanda, for example, where where they were trying to go through this process, but the, when you had people that committed genocide come into the village to apologize to pre peep survivors who they killed their entire families, very hard to accept an apology of that nature. Only the strong can accept an apology in those circumstances. But once that has been done, that third step, it now clears the air for acts of atonement because the burden then shifts back to the perpetrator to perform concrete acts of, uh, of atonement, to try to uh, make uh, wipe the slate clean as much as possible, do remedial acts, and in this instance it is to implement these human rights because the current framework is totally bereft of the human right principle. Mm -hmm. and, and through these, uh, through these uh, uh, measures and implementing them, these would be considered to be acts of uh, atonement to repair a painful past and move to the fifth step, which is reconciliation. Once this has all been done, we then sit at the center of human compassion. We've done everything we can do 
that uh, our, our humanity knows how to do. I am you, you are me, and, and we are one, and we have reconciled, and we're back, we're reunited and more strong. You know, These kinds of steps, I think we need to go through along the way. Sometimes and often, and especially I think when you're, you're seeing justice, remedial justice, it's often the steps in doing that are just as important as the end product. And I think that's why we need a truth telling and national reconciliation in the way that we implement these human rights. Yeah. And I not, yeah. not make it done begrudgingly. <laughs> no, that that's right. And I, I think a really important point uh, that you that you are making is that in all the examples I've seen, however fully successful or not fully successful it was, but it happened. Of, of this process taking place, and it's happened in Canada, it's happened in Australia, it has happened in New Zealand, uh, which are countries with large indigenous populations. It has always been pinned, as you pointed out, uh, Walter, uh, so effectively on a sense of human rights, that that's what, that's what human rights require. And so if, if the United States could sort of shift to a different gear, uh, as you've described, in talking about human rights, um, I think that we would get further with that. Uh, although I do not expect to happen it in the present, but it may happen in the future, and I would hope it does. Um, well, let's see, do we have time for another? Well, we're just about to 728. So I will, I will leave it to our interlocutor whether we can actually have another question or we will need to start wrapping up. I would uh, actually leave that to Gary. Go ahead, Gary. <laughs> so, Julie, do we have a short, quick question, and then we'll, if we can get a quick answer, we'll we'll wrap her up for the evening. Because we we could listen to you guys all night. This is amazing. <laughs> there there are some. Um, I don't know if they're short, quick questions, but there there are a few left. Let's let's go with this one. You stated that since the 1980s, laws protecting Native American rights have been gradually curtailed. This seems to parallel the reduction in public sympathy for affirmative action and other policies to benefit Black Americans. What factors do you think are most important in this decline, and are there political actions or policies that could reverse this trend? Okay, we'll yeah. be Seconds. Yeah, that's maybe not an easy question. <laughs> I, I would I would think this is going to be my prediction from Oklahoma, and and uh, you know we look around the country today and and we see a racial reckoning taking place, and um, I think that that racial reckoning is going to uh, continue and even grow because I believe that the excesses from the White House. Uh, have created a uh, backlash against the division and the racial hate and the ill will that pervades our society. And during that backlash, uh, uh, we're going to see a wave towards racial reckoning, and it just sets the stage for a human rights and a reconciliation with our native peoples, you know, because it's so it, uh, consistent with that. Um, and so I think, I think being an optimist, I feel that the stars are aligned and we need to be ready to take advantage of it, ride that first wave on that backlash across this country all the way to Washington, D.C. Well, that's a, that's a happier note to end on. And I think there uh, we should uh, turn it back to you now, Gary. Well, thank you both so much, Walter and Rick, for sharing this illuminating conversation with us. Um, I would like to invite all our attendees to visit the Be The Change website to see all our many upcoming events celebrating Native American Heritage Month. Our next author event will be on Monday, November 30th. Uh, 6.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Uh, when uh, author David uh, Heska Wandley Wyden, an enrolled member of the Shichungu Lakota Nation and winner of the 2020 Spur Award from the Western Writers of America, um, will be speaking. David will discuss his newly, new critically acclaimed 
and I might add by the Los Angeles Times and others, uh, mystery novel, Winter Counts. Uh, Mr. Wyden will be in conversation with Edgar Award nominee, Marcy Rendon, who's an enrolled member of the White Earth Nation. Uh, Marcy's an author, playwright, poet, and freelance writer in her own right, and was recently named a distinguished artist by the McKnight Foundation. I also wanna share with our Glendale audience an event that may be of interest. On Sunday, November 15th at 3 p.m., the Glendale Environmental Coalition will host an online panel discussion on environmental justice and environmental racism, exploring the intersection of environmental harms with social justice and questions of how to address equity issues in, in Glendale. Uh, you can email your RSVP to contact at gec.eco should you wish to attend. Um, again, thank you for joining us this evening and a heartfelt thanks to Walter and Rick. Thank you both. Could again, go on all night chatting with you, but um, everyone have a wonderful night. It was an amazing conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.